Hey guys, Galaxy Studios here. I said a couple things in my last video. I said that I had done three playthroughs of Terraria when I wrote the script. I also said that I would be back with more hardcore gaming. So, yeah, I did hardcore Terraria. And I really shouldn't have. This was probably the second most frustrating challenge I've ever experienced in a video game, only behind Run and Run's second tab of the fight. I didn't record the footage because I generally only recorded boss fights for that run, so I still don't know how in the world I ever beat that fight deathless with the level of skill I had. But back on topic, you already know what Terraria Hardcore is. I'm beating the game without dying once, and I decided to do it on expert mode. Without further ado, let's jump right in. Disclaimer, for my winning attempt, I use quality of life mods. While this could be interpreted as against the spirit of the challenge, I had no interest in going through the grinding I went through twice, and I made sure to avoid using them in a way that would eliminate risk. I don't know how my first attempt died, or my second, or my third, or my fourth. I knew that most of my deaths would happen in the pre-boss stage of the game, and I was more than prepared to continue resetting. And I did. But over the course of these attempts, I got better and better and better at just not dying, and I was able to get closer and closer to the light at the end of the tunnel that was pre-boss. Once I was out of early game, I felt confident I could easily make it to hard mode, and potentially through the entire game but a lot of my characters died to get there. Attempt 10 died to me significantly underestimating the range of dynamite when mining for Crimtane. Attempt 12 died to 4 demonized somehow managing to overpower my platinum gear when I was caught without a recall potion. Attempt 18, my best run at that point, died to a boulder trap when I was about to challenge the goblin army. And attempt 23 made it past the goblin army before another boulder ended my run minutes away from challenging my first boss. As for attempt 24, it's the footage you've been seeing on screen this entire time. This was the first run to find the Goblin Tinkerer, and after some reforging, I took down the Eye of Cthulhu, quickly followed by the Brain. This gave me access to Hellstone, and with Molten Gear, I was easily able to tear my way through the rest of pre-hard mode. After a lot of preparation, I went to the Underworld and thrashed the Wall of Flesh, launching my world into hard mode. Early hard mode is by far the part of the game I was the most scared of after pre-boss, and instead of breaking Crimson Altars, I just fished up the hard mode ores. And then I died to a big run. Yep. At this point, I was done messing around. I had no intention of holding back anymore. Attempt 25 would be the one. But before that, this video was sponsored by me! Thanks to your support and my run and bun video popping off to a degree I could never have foreseen, I have YouTube memberships now. If you want to spend $5 per month on me for some reason, you'll get access to some short member exclusive content with each major video I release, including this one. I'll have higher membership tiers as soon as I figure out what the heck that means. If you want to support the channel, feel free to click the join button, or just subscribe. Anyway, back to the video. After making it past the pre-boss grind without dying, defeating the Goblin Army once again, and finding the Goblin Tinkerer, I equipped four mobility accessories and the Band of Regeneration and shot the Eye of Cthulhu to death with my Mini Shark. The Eye dropped the rest of the Crimtane I needed to craft the Tendon Bow, which I selected as my primary fire for the next boss fight, the Brain of Cthulhu. Despite the debuffs inflicted by the creepers being incredibly annoying, Jester Arrows managed to cleave through the first phase of the fight and he improvised from there using my Trimarang, Blood Butcherer, and Mini Shark to finish off the Brain of Cthulhu and giving me access to Hellstone. I pick up a bunch, craft a full set of Molten Armor and some Hellstone weapons, and finish off the bundle of Horseshoe Balloons. Skeletron didn't pose that much of a challenge as long as I stayed mobile. With the Molten Fury and Hellfire Arrows to deal damage at range and the Volcano to hammer Skeletron while he's spinning, it wasn't long before I had access to the dungeon. With a full warding build and molten gear, the dungeon didn't pose much of a challenge and I was able to snag a Muramasa, how you doing, Cobalt Shield, Shadow Key, and Handgun. I had the four required swords, so I crafted the Knight's Edge, quite solidly the best weapon in pre hard mode. Using it and the Phoenix Blaster, I destroyed the Queen Bee as a quick warm up for what's coming next. For the Wall of Flesh, I actually dropped the Magic Luminescence. Not for the Shield of Cthulhu, but for an even better and incredibly obscure movement accessory that somehow managed to perfectly fill the niche I was looking for. The Sweetheart Necklace. Not that it really mattered, the 1.4.4 Night's Edge is basically designed to obliterate the Wall of Flesh. Into hard mode we go, and this time I'm not using my Tundra Farm until I have to. After fishing up the hard mode ores and crafting a full Adamantite melee set, I head to the Underworld to farm for Souls of Light and Night. I also farmed Hallowed, Crimson, and Regular Mimics for some gear and a certain weapon. I don't have footage for all of this, but I made absolutely sure to play this incredibly safe throughout. Messing up against a Hallowed or Crimson Mimic means death, and I made sure I never did. For my first mechanical boss, I chose the Destroyer. It's the easiest for me, and I have a great weapon for it. 
Despite using the Adamantite melee set, my primary fire for the first two mechanical bosses is going to be the Daedalus Stormbow. I have experience using it, and it's a reliable source of damage even after the nerf. Thanks to Unholy Arrows' piercing and high damage, and my Knight's Edge still being a pretty good option to clear out the probes, the Destroyer is destroyed, giving me access to Hallowed Gear and Light Discs. Skeletron Prime wasn't much harder. Using Light Discs in the Stormbow once again, this time with Ikor Arrows, I was able to keep him at a distance and take out the Laser Hand. The fight was over from there. The Twins were up next, and not only were they the mech I was the most scared of, they were the only boss besides Moon Lord I could see ending my run. In preparation for the fight, I completed the Tier 2 Old Ones army to purchase two pieces of Squire armor, killed Queen Slime for the Blade Staff, an upgrade to my Summon Sidearm, and challenged the Hardwell Goblin army to get the Shadow Flame Knife, my primary weapon for this fight. For armor, I kept the Hallowed Mask but added the Squire's Plating and Squire's Grease. In exchange for Holy Protection, I get the most defense possible in any armor set at this point of the game, and sprint offensive and mobility buffs on top of that. As for accessories, after Boots, Wings, and Shield, I decided to use Charm of Myths for the reduced healing cooldowns, Worm Scarf for the damage reduction, and Berserker's Glove for the added defense. Despite me worrying for a very long time about the twins, they stood absolutely no chance. With Chlorophyte now spawning, it was time for me to upgrade my gear. I finished off the Onk Shield, a required accessory for Plantera, grabbed 21 Life Fruits to max out my health and get the Aegis Fruit, and crafted the True Knight's Edge and True Excalibur, the latter of which will be my primary weapon for Plantera. For Plantera, despite Turtle Armor being available at this point of the game, I pass on it for now, instead opting for the same mixed armor set I used to be the Twins. The reason why is simple. My goal for this fight is to kill the boss fast. In that vein, despite reforging all of my accessories to warding and equipping the Worm Scarf, I also equipped both the Mechanical Glove and the Fire Gauntlet, stacking my damage output pretty high. There was nothing left to do besides break Plantera's bulb and start the fight. With Plantera down, I have access to plenty of new resources and upgrades. First, I went to the dungeon to hunt down Bone Leads to get the components for the Master Ninja gear, as well as Paladins for the Paladin's Shield. I also finally visited my underground Tundra farm to upgrade that shield to the Frozen Shield, and didn't die this time. After farming the post-Plantera Eclipse for the Broken Hero Sword, crafting the most important item of the run and also the Terra Blade, and fighting all six Skeleton Gunners and Mages for funsies, I tackle Golem. This time, running Turtle Armor, upgrading to the Frozen Shield, and dropping my Worm Scarf for the Master Ninja Gear, using a dash for the first time in this run. The Terra Blade absolutely thrashed Golem, and it was on to the endgame. First post Golem boss up is the one out of the three I'm the most confident in taking down, the Empress of Light.
never lost more than a quarter of my health throughout the entire fight, and the Terrorblade, even at this stage of the game, seriously outperforms any other option. I'd go so far as to say it's better than any pre-cultist melee weapon. Well, except for the weapon I hunt down next by taking down the tier 3 Old Ones army. Valhalla Knight armor pays off here, significantly buffing my Ballastay and giving me some serious life regen. It's the only time after Golem I dropped Beetle Shell, and it was worth it here. Betsy wasn't much of a challenge, and I get the weapon I'm going to use for the rest of the game, the Flying Dragon. It's harder to aim than the Terrorblade and doesn't benefit from melee speed bonuses, but it hits so much harder that it's still the best option for me right now. I immediately use it to take down Duke Fishron, giving me access to the Shrimpy Truffle, which I plan to cheese Moonlord with. However, after a quick win against the Lunatic Cultist, one more obstacle bars me from that particular fight. Using the Flying Dragon's ability to pierce through blocks, I take down first the Stardust, then Solar, then Vortex Pillars with only a little bit of a scare on Vortex. As for Nebula, the Flying Dragon performed much better than I expected it to, keeping the Nebula floaters off of me while I took down the pillar. With only Moonlord left, I exited and rejoined the world to prepare my build. I said in my last video that the Shrimpy Truffle saves at least two accessory slots, and you're about to see that in action. I was able to drop my dash, wings, and the Soaring Insignia for this fight, resulting in a full warding build with six defensive accessories. For weapons, although I have access to Daybreak, I'm not comfortable enough with aiming it at the eyes to use it as my primary fire, instead opting for the Flying Dragon one final time. I hope you enjoy this upcoming fight, especially since I'm literally going as defensive as possible, and I've only got one more thing to say. This isn't my last Terraria video. Bye guys! Finally happened. 25 attempts. 23 of them dead before a boss. One of them died to throw an early hard mode. That's all it takes. All I need to do is learn how to not die before a boss. Terraria Hardcore has been defeated! <laughs>